If you're into math at all, there's a good chance you've encountered the idea that infinity can come in different sizes, that some infinities are bigger than other infinities. It's certainly a mind-blowing idea, and there's no shortage of resources that explain it. But I suspect many people, especially given how much it's been covered, might come away feeling that, yeah, I guess it's an interesting concept and all, but it's not like it's practical or anything. We live in a finite world, and so this is just another one of those theoretical rabbit holes that mathematicians like to get themselves stuck in. And well, maybe to some extent that's true. However, I wonder how many people are aware of just how widespread this idea actually is in the various branches of math. It might come as a surprise to find that the sizes of infinity and their related concepts appear in many areas of math, like in topology, analysis, and measure theory, you'll encounter words that, directly or indirectly, involve the sizes of infinity. Now, I don't mean to say that the sizes of infinity utterly permeate these fields, or that those who study these subjects are constantly thinking about it. But for an idea that seems like the most up in the clouds of theoretical musings, it finds its way into some pretty practical fields of study. So in this video, I'd like to explore some of the significance and usefulness of the sizes of infinity, which I haven't seen discussed very often, and perhaps also give some sense of why this idea is fundamental and lies at the foundation of math. What we're heading toward is a certain problem involving walking through a minefield with infinitely many mines packed infinitely densely and how the differing sizes of infinity give a really neat and surprisingly powerful solution to this problem. But before we get into all that, it might be worthwhile to briefly go over what exactly we mean by sizes of infinity and one infinity being bigger than another. How we measure infinity, in other words. Now again, this idea has already been covered profusely in other places, so I'll just give a quick review of it here. For those of you already familiar with these ideas, you can skip ahead to this timestamp if you want. Alright, to measure infinity, we need a standard ruler, an infinite unit of measurement, so to speak. The standard unit for that is the set of positive whole numbers, the so-called natural numbers. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. We can compare another infinite set of objects to the standard set by seeing if we can pair up each object in our given set with a unique natural number, leaving no leftovers from either set. If we can find such a pairing, called a one-to-one -one correspondence in the business, we declare that the two sets have the same size, or the same number of objects. By the way, the technical term used for the number of objects in an infinite set is cardinality, and for the case of our standard ruler of the natural numbers, if a set contains the same number of objects, that is, has the same cardinality, as the standard set of natural numbers, we call that set countably infinite because labeling the objects of a set with a unique natural number is basically what counting means. This essentially means you can arrange the objects of your set into an infinitely long list. This can be done for a lot of typical infinite sets. For example, the set of negative whole numbers can be arranged in a list pretty straightforwardly. Just start at negative 1 and go down from there. But you can also arrange the set of all integers, both positive and negative whole numbers and zero, into a list as well by breaking it into two pieces and interleaving them, basically having each negative number followed by its positive counterpart before moving on to the next negative number. You can even arrange all the rational numbers, that is, fractions of whole numbers, like one-half or five-thirds or eleven-sixths, into a single infinitely long list. To do it, you first arrange the rational numbers into an infinitely big table, where moving within a row increases the numerator, and moving within a column increases the denominator. You then weave a zigzagging string through the table which passes through all the diagonal lines. Unwrap this string and delete the fractions, like two-fourths, which are duplicates of simpler fractions like one-half, and you've put every single rational number into a single list, leading to the rather surprising conclusion that there are as many positive whole numbers as there are whole number fractions. So after seeing all this, you might conclude that all infinities are the same. And maybe that's not so surprising. You have infinitely many natural numbers, so you can never run out of them, right? So is this the rule then? All infinities are countably infinite? Well, spoilers, the answer is no. The classic example is the set of all real numbers, 
that is, all decimal numbers, including irrational numbers that can't be written as a fraction of integers. Numbers like pi, e, and the square root of 2 live here. It turns out the set of all real numbers can't be paired up with the natural numbers without leaving leftovers. To see why, pretend you actually did, meaning you found a way to arrange all of the real numbers into an infinitely long list. No matter what list of real numbers you come up with, I can always find a number you missed. To see how, let's limit our view to real numbers between 0 and 1, and let's say your list of numbers looks like this. Now highlight all the digits along the main diagonal line starting with the first digit after the decimal point, and construct a new real number between 0 and 1 by copying all these digits in order, but changing each one to some other digit. The resulting real number you get from doing this can't possibly be on the list, because each real number in your list conflicts with this new number at at least one decimal place. For instance, the first number in your list differs with the new number at the first decimal place, the second number in your list differs with the new number at the second decimal place, and in general, the nth number in your list differs from the new number, at the very least, at the nth decimal place. So this new number is sure to be different from every number in your list, meaning it's not on it. Now, you might think you can get around this problem by simply adding this new number to the top of your list. But then I can just play the same trick again to find yet another new number you missed. And so because I can play this trick with any list of real numbers you give me, it means the set of all real numbers is fundamentally not listable. That is, it is uncountable. So in a certain precise sense, there are just simply more real numbers than there are natural numbers. You can never properly pair them up. The cardinality of the reals is strictly greater than that of the naturals. Real number infinity is bigger than natural number infinity. Now, you can keep going with this and even find infinite sets whose cardinality is greater than that of the real numbers. But all we really need here, and in most situations I think, is just that there are infinities that are larger than the countably infinite. So we can broadly classify sets into three main categories. Finite sets that contain just a finite number of objects, like 12 or 100 or a Googleplex. Countably infinite sets, which are infinite but can still be arranged in a list, like integers, rational numbers and their subsets. And finally, the uncountable sets, infinite sets that have too many members to list, like the real numbers, or any interval of real numbers, like 0 to 1 or negative 3 to 7. Okay, great. So what can we do with all this stuff? Well, solve problems, of course. So without further ado, let's try out this new mathematical toy. To begin, let's say you've made me angry for some reason, and so in traditional morbid mathematical fashion, I exact my revenge by making you solve a puzzle with fatal consequences if you fail. In this case, I transport you to a 1 km by 1 km square island in the middle of the ocean and set you down at its southwest corner. There's a boat located at the northeast corner which leads to freedom, but using the vast mathematical powers vested within me, I have peppered the island with infinitely many landmines in the following way. Draw a grid system over the island, where the island takes up the standard 1 by 1 unit square of the grid. So you're located at the origin, 0, 0, and the boat leading to freedom is located at 1, 1. The mines are scattered throughout the island, such that there is one mine at every point on the island whose coordinates in this grid system are both rational numbers. So there's a mine at the point 1 half, 1 half, another one at 1 third, 3 fourths, and yet another one at 3 fourteenths, 15 90 seconds. The only exceptions to this are the points 0, 0 and 1, 1, which is where you start and where you need to get to. However, to be clear, there are only mines at points where both coordinates are rational. So the point 4 fifths, comma, square root of 2 over 2 does not have a mine because the second coordinate is irrational. Your task is to find a way to travel through the island and get to the exit boat without setting off any of the mines, which will only explode if you step exactly on top of them. Oh, and you can't swim either. The waters are infested with monsters of the worst kind. Take a moment to digest the scale of the problem here. The mines are packed to an infinite density everywhere on the island. 
Now obviously, I can't draw infinitely many mines in this picture, but in reality, every square meter, square centimeter, square nanometer of the island contains infinitely many mines. And so in taking even the smallest imaginable step in any direction from anywhere, you have infinitely many mines which you somehow need to avoid. Have fun! This might seem at first like an impossibly difficult task. What kind of crazy path could possibly weave so intricately as to deftly dodge infinitely many mines that are infinitely close to every single point along the path? Sounds like you'd need some kind of hyper-intricate fractal curve or something, right? Well, maybe. But before we go too far down that road, notice this. True, there are infinitely many mines, but you know that infinity comes in different sizes. Which infinity is the infinity of this minefield? Are there a countably infinite number of them, or uncountably many? It turns out there are only countably infinitely many. Can you see why? Pause now if you'd like to think through it yourself. I bet you can. Well, to start, we already know the set of all rational numbers is countably infinite. But what's different here is that to determine the number of mines, we're not just dealing with single rational numbers, but with pairs of rational numbers, because there's a mine at every point where both coordinates are rational. So there are as many mines as there are pairs of rational numbers. Or, I guess more strictly, pairs of rational numbers between 0 and 1. However, since we already know the set of rational numbers is countably infinite, we can arrange them in a list. That means that pairs of rational numbers can be arranged in an infinite table, where moving within a column takes the first coordinate through our list of rationals, and moving within a row takes the second coordinate through our list of rationals. This should look awfully familiar. This is the same table construction we started with when proving that the set of single rational numbers was countably infinite. So we can play the same trick again. Weave a string back and forth through all the diagonal lines of the table, unwind it, and we've got a list of all pairs of rational numbers. Thus, the set of all rational pairs is also countably infinite, and so there are only countably infinitely many minds on the island. Okay, that's cool, I guess. But how does that help? Sure, the number of minds is only countably infinite, but that's still a lot. Infinitely many, and packed infinitely densely. Doesn't seem like we're any closer to finding a way to navigate this minefield. Well, I know it may not look like it, but we're actually so tantalizingly close. There's just one observation to make that will cause everything to fall into place. And maybe some of you have already guessed it. So get ready, the punchline's coming. For a moment, instead of trying to avoid the mines, let's imagine trying to hit them. For any given mine, the literally most straightforward way to hit it would be to walk along the line connecting you to it, pretending for the moment you somehow don't set off the other mines while in transit. What this means is that every single mine can be associated with a unique linear path passing through you at the origin. And since there are only countably infinitely many mines, this means there are only countably infinitely many linear paths that hit a mine. But how many linear paths in general are there that pass through the origin, regardless of whether they pass through a mine or not? Well, we can describe any line passing through the origin using the classic linear equation y equals mx, where m is the slope of your line. We get a unique line for every possible value of the slope m we plug in. But here's the punchline. There are uncountably many slope values we could plug in, because a slope can be any real number. Thus, there are uncountably many linear paths that run through the origin. And since only countably infinitely many of those paths hit a mine, it means there are infinitely many, in fact, uncountably many, linear paths that don't go through any mines. The implication here borders on the absurd. It means that if you want to walk around on the island without hitting any mines, just pick a random direction to go in, and you will almost surely, with probability infinitely close to certain, not hit a single mine. I thought you said this was supposed to be hard. However, if you actually want to reach the exit boat, you'll have to be slightly more clever. If you decide to head straight toward the exit boat at the northeast corner, along the 45 degree line y equals x, that path is actually one of the linear paths that hits mines. Infinitely many of them, in fact. 
all the minds at coordinates with duplicate rational numbers. But it's not too hard to construct an alternate path. Start by picking an arbitrary one of the uncountably many linear paths that don't hit any minds. Then consider all the possible linear paths leading to the exit boat that intersect your chosen starting path. This subset of possible paths will also have to be uncountable, since they correspond to an interval of slope values, in this case, the interval from 0 to 1, a slice of the real number line, which is still uncountable. This means we can pick out a second mind-free line that connects to the exit boat, but also intersects the first line. So just follow the two-segment path they form, and you'll get to the exit boat no problem. So congratulations! You've successfully navigated an infinitely dense minefield by measuring and comparing infinities. I hope you know your way home. But aside from being pretty cool, there's something important I want you to notice about the solution. We didn't actually have to think about how the mines were arranged on the island. When you first see this problem, I expect your first instinct is to try to find some useful pattern or structure in the precise locations of the mines that might help. Somehow use the fact that the locations of the mines are always at whole number fractions to derive some clever strategy of avoiding them. But actually, none of that mattered. It's possible to solve this problem no matter how the mines are distributed, as long as there are only countably many of them. I could rearrange the mines in any arbitrary distribution, and you would still be able to easily find a path avoiding all of them just by comparing infinities. I could even surround each individual mine with a miniature copy of the entire minefield, and it wouldn't make a difference. There just simply aren't enough mines for their positions on the island to matter. This is one reason why cardinality and measuring infinity matter. If cardinality won't allow something to happen, then you can automatically ignore everything else. And this is also why the other abstract notions and structures of math matter too. It's good to know what category of structure is at play in a particular problem, or at least know what your options are. In some cases, cardinality, that is, the measure of infinity, is all you need. In other cases, it's just the basic geometric properties of topology that are at play. Other times, algebraic properties and how objects can be combined makes the difference. So being familiar with these different structures can sometimes help you avoid doing a lot of unnecessary work. Like in this minefield problem. All we needed was the extremely broad stroke structure of cardinality to solve it. No need to think about where the mines are located, how they bunch together, or anything else more precise. The very broad stroke category of cardinality is all we needed. Now admittedly, because cardinality is such a basic structure, only caring about the number of objects in a set, and not how they relate to one another, you can't often rely on it alone to solve many problems, because often what makes a problem interesting or complicated involves other structures the objects possess. But it is pretty satisfying those rare times when a hard problem can be solved just by invoking some basic property like cardinality and it serves to illustrate why learning about other abstract structures in math can also be worthwhile.